I could have you grab a seat. Good, good. All right. Man, so excited that you are here. Um, I, I don't usually do the announcements, as you might have noticed, uh, but it's just exciting to be in the same space with you. Um, we are in a great series called Our Story, and we're going to continue this week again with the impossible task of trying to encapsulate a person's entire life in 35 minutes. So just know, I just set the expectation, I'm going to short sheet Jacob a little bit in the same way that I short sheeted Abraham. Now here's, here's the, 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 the focus here is that you can always go home and read your Bible because all I'm going to do is add commentary to the Bible. So I would encourage you to do that because these are amazing, amazing historical stories about men and women who walked with God and they give us an understanding of what it looks like for us to walk with God. Before we do that, today is important because it is Father's Day. And so we want to celebrate fathers in the same way that we celebrate mothers. And really, honestly, as a lot of dads have already told me, like, man, it's, it's an everyday thing. So hopefully we're celebrating mothers and fathers every day. But this is the day particularly where we recognize them. And in the same way, like just on Mother's Day where we prayed for the mothers, we want to spend a little time this morning praying for the fathers. So if you would join me as we talk to God, and then we'll get into our study. Let's pray. Ah, Father, you are good. We thank you that by the blood of your son, Jesus Christ, that we can call you Father. Today, we remember and honor fathers. And above all, we honor you, the Father to all who trust in you and the creator of every one and everything. By faith in Jesus, we receive the spirit of adoption as your children, by whom we cry, Abba, Father, you are a loving and good Father. Father, we thank you for the fathers among us, and we celebrate and ask your blessings on fathers of all ages, of soon-to-be fathers, of young fathers, of middle-aged fathers, of older fathers, of grandfathers, and even great-grandfathers. For stepfathers, foster fathers, mentor fathers, and spiritual fathers. For single fathers and men who long to be fathers. For those who have lost their fathers, and for fathers who have lost children. Most fathers do not demand or expect thanks or recognition which makes our recognition of them even more important. We thank fathers of every kind for the sacrifices they make for their families and for their children. Thank you for a good father's desire to reflect your heart to their children. We pray that you would remind each father of the privilege, the gift, and the responsibility of fatherhood. Encourage them with your love and cover them with your grace as they fall short. Help them to know that their identity and acceptance is found in you and you alone. Fill those fathers who are weary and struggling. Fill them with new strength for the high calling of fatherhood. May they know your spirit's power in their weakness. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our fathers whom you specifically chose for us by your sovereign grace, whether by natural birth, adoption, or through our spiritual family, we thank you for the gift of fathers. For those who have had good fathers, we thank you, God, for their example and their care, for their wisdom and for their presence in our lives. May our honor of them be a reflection of our honor of you. For those who did not have good memories of their fathers, we pray for their comfort and for the strength of your Holy Spirit. We ask that you would heal the wounds made by uncaring fathers and father figures who have left more wounding than blessing. We pray for the patience to understand, the mercy to forgive, and the courage to move forward with you as our ultimate. Father, 
for the fathers who are estranged from their children or their child, for anyone who is unreconciled with their own father, we pray that you would bring to pass the promise of Malachi 4, 6, and you will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. For those who have never known their father, may they be more aware than ever that you are the father to the fatherless and that nothing in all creation will be able to separate us from the love that is in Christ Jesus. Father God, be close to us no matter what this day finds in us and guide us closer to your strong and loving heart. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's honor the fathers in the room. tell you, much more than Mother's Day, that seems weirdly self-aggrandizing. So uh, well, let's move on quickly. <laughs> As we get into this series, it is no mistake that we are going through a series of fathers and children. We are in what is known as the patriarchs of the Old Testament. And we started last week with Abraham. And I'm going to have to fly this morning to get through all of Jacob. So you'll forgive me and I encourage you again, make sure that you are reading on your own because it is such an amazing story. It's a powerful story. And so as we read about Jacob in, in his story, the theme of ours is that we are part of God's story. And that is really the title of what we're looking at in this series is that our story is God's story. He is the center and that you and I are part of something that is bigger than ourselves, something that provides purpose for our lives, something that provides direction for our lives. And I hope you know this as we read these stories, although these men and women lived long, long ago, they are still human beings. They are much like us. And ultimately, they are interacting with a God who is past, present, and future who is present in all those times at once, who knows exactly what is going to happen in your life, who has made provision for your future. And that is what we put our hope and our trust in, that God loves us and is good. And so I would encourage you as you hear this, this is your spiritual genealogy. This is your spiritual DNA. These are members of the faith family who walked with God in powerful ways. And so I want to encourage you that as we hear these stories to involve yourselves, to hear them as almost autobiographical, because the same God who works in their lives works in ours. And so the main thing we're going to see this morning is that new life begins with surrender. This is Jacob's story, and it is all of the stories of those who have trusted Christ. We're going to look at three sections, and we're going to go through it quickly, and I'm going to have to hedge a little bit because there's so many details I want to give you because this story is so good. We're going to first start with Jacob's story from the very beginning up to the point where he struggles with God. Next, we'll talk about his encounter with God, and finally, I want to give some implications of this story for us. What does it look like to be made new? and to have new life. And so before we get there, what we do each week, and not just as a placeholder, but as a reminder to us that what we are going to hear is God's word, we're going to say out loud Psalm 119, 105. And here's the cool thing. It's not just that this is God's word for us to hear and to file away, but God provides his word to guide us, to direct our lives, and ultimately to draw us close to him, to know him. So let's say this out loud before we get into our text. Your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. Very good. Okay, so let's start with Jacob's story. We're going to have to go through this fast, but it's so good. So uh, basically there is a, an intermediate story between um, Abraham and Jacob, and that is the story of Isaac. And you remember from last week that Abraham gave... Uh, the, had a son named Isaac, and this was the son of promise. This was a son that was going to continue the covenant. And ultimately, what we saw last week was this amazing act of faith where Abraham brought his son Isaac up to the mountain to sacrifice him, but God provided for him. 
And so Isaac has a really cool story, by the way. This is so much better than any Nicholas Sparks nonsense. But there is a, sorry, this is a romance story. Hey, Bible ain't, <laughs> Nicholas Sparks ain't got nothing on the Bible. Let me tell you why. So Isaac is looking for a bride. So he sends, I told you I wouldn't get into stuff, but I got to get into stuff. So he sends his servant to go find a bride, and he runs into Rebecca in answer to his prayers. And it's this beautiful story of bringing Isaac and Rebecca together. And, and you think, oh, man, this is going to be so wonderful. And it turns out to just be another human story <laughs> because Isaac and Rebecca are very human parents, as we all are. And so what happens is that Isaac prays for Rebecca because she's not able to have children and God allows her to become pregnant and not just pregnant, but pregnant with twins. Now, I can't even imagine being pregnant with a child, let alone two children. Now, within her womb, the twins are jostling around. It's like they're fighting inside of her, which if, as you know, if, you, if you've been a father, the first time you see like an arm go by, it's like, oh, it's like a scene from Aliens, man. It's, it's like, it's seriously like, oh, are you kidding me? But I can't even imagine two boys jostling within her. And it's revealed that what is inside of Rebecca are what would become two powerful nations. And so ultimately, Rebecca gives birth. And the first child that is born is named Esau. And his name means Harry which is just awesome because in the day you would just name what you saw, right? And so this child is born and he is covered with red hair, which is awesome. And, and, and as he's coming out, I'm just imagining this, there's, a, there's another person grabbing onto his heel. So his brother Jacob is grabbing onto Esau's heel as he's born. So they give him the name Jacob, which means heel grabber. Yeah, literally, it means heel grabber. Now you're like, well, that's, that's an interesting name. It, it's more than just heel grabber. It means someone who is deceptive, a trickster, someone who is deceitful. And you want to keep in mind that whenever someone is given a name, it has meaning. And so a person's name represents what that person is like, especially in the Bible. We saw it with Abram and Abraham and Sarai and Sarah last week. And so these two boys are born into the family, and you think, oh, this is going to be great. There's a problem already. The parents like the boys differently, so they pick favorites. And this is just where the Bible is, again, it, it's descriptive but not prescriptive. Even if you like one of your kids better than another, how many of you know that you can't show favoritism? You seriously can't. I only get away with saying that my daughter is my favorite daughter because she's my only daughter. <laughs> My boys, I can't say that. I say, you're my favorite oldest son, and you're my favorite youngest son. <laughs> and they're like, Dad, we're all your favorite. I'm like, darn right. <laughs> so, you, but, but here's, that's not what happened, because Isaac loved Esau more. Esau was a man of the field. He was like the Cabela spokesperson. And so he was a hunter, and he would make his dad tasty stew. So, so Isaac loved Esau. And then um, Rebecca loved Jacob. And Jacob was a guy who was more around the tents, and, and, he, and we see him doing several times. We see him doing some cooking, okay? So he was more like homes and gardens, and uh, both men, but different men. And so God used both of these men in, in, in different ways, but his parents loved them differently. And so we'll see that actually creates a problem, but before we get there, we see an early conflict between, uh, between these two. What happens is, is Isaac is out in the field, and he's hunting. And he is famished. And I don't know if you've ever been like beyond hangry. I don't know what's beyond hangry, but he was beyond hangry. So he was hungry, what he thought was almost to the point of death. So he came in, he said, Jacob, make me some food right now. And that's not uncommon of an older brother to a younger brother, right? Like cook me up some grub. <laughs> I see that in my family. I'm one of three brothers. I have both said, had that said to me and said that to my younger brother. And so he says, make me some food. And Jacob being what? A trickster, a deceiver, he said, sure, I'll make you some food, but uh, give me your birthright. It was a big deal in the Old Testament, right? That means a lineage would flow through him. And Jacob's like, what good is a birthright if I'm dead? Make me the food. And so he makes him the food, if you can believe it, and loses his birthright to eat to Jacob. Now, as the story goes on, after Jacob is born, we see that Jacob will eventually deceive his brother. And Jacob deceives his brother directly as Isaac is getting old. 
And Isaac is so old that he is losing his sight. And he, he basically says, hey, go Esau and make me, go, go get me some tasty meat and make it into stew and I will give you your blessing. Well, Rebecca hears this and because she favors the other son, Jacob, more, she goes and gets Jacob and says, hey, we need to dress you up like Esau. And then when you come in, then your father will give you Esau's blessing. And Jacob's like, I don't think this is a good idea. And Rebecca's like, no, it'll work, trust me. And so that's in there. That's the new Miller version, but it's in there. <laughs> okay, and so she dresses him in son of Esau's clothes. Why? S for the smell. And then she coats his hands, which were probably a little softer than Esau's, with, with some, some sheep skin, goat skin. And so walks in and eventually tricks Isaac into giving Esau's blessing to him. And so he gets the blessing and he leaves. And then Esau comes back in and he's like, okay, pops, I'm ready for my blessing. Woohoo! And Isaac's like, oh man, I, I, I just gave your blessing away. And he's shaking violently. Like I can't, I, I gave it to someone else. And Esau is so mad. He's like, basically, I'm going to wait until my dad dies and I'm going to kill him. And, and so the idea of a brother wanting to kill another brother is as old as, well, Genesis. <laughs> that goes way back. And so he is consoling himself. And Rebecca says, hey, you need to get out of here. Your brother is trying to kill you. And so ultimately, at that point, Jacob takes off. And Jacob flees to Haran. Now, where have we heard of Haran before? <gasps> Last week. All right, so he goes back to where his dad's hometown was. You remember, Abraham went from Haran down to the promised land. And now Jacob is leaving the promised land back to Haran. And when he gets there, this is our third scene, and I'm only giving you three this morning. But we get Jacob, Laban, Rachel, and Leah. Now, I wish I could get more into this part because it's so cool. This is where you go home and read your Bible. There's so many interesting little lines that come together in this story. But Jacob, when he gets to Haran, he sees Rachel. And she is beautiful. And he's like, man, I want her to be my wife. So he goes to Laban and he's like, I will work for you. I just need you to give her to me as my wife. I want to be married to her. And so Laban's like, hey, I will give you one of my daughters if you work seven years. He never says Rachel. So good. Because the, the, the trickster gets tricked. Right? Isn't that the best way to learn something, right? If you've got a kid that bites kids, what do you do to solve the problem? put him in with other kids that bite kids. And they're like, ouch, that hurts. Maybe I should stop doing that. So the deceiver gets deceived and he works for seven years for Rachel. And the Bible says it went by like, like nobody's business because he was so in love with Rachel. And ultimately on his wedding night, the, the father Laban does a switcheroo and, and gives him Leah instead. Now here's the, the sad part about this. Okay, the, the saddest part for me is Leah. Now, Leah, it is said that she had weak eyes. And so if you're reading that in your Bible, you run over that really quickly. But what it means is that she was not as attractive as Rachel. And so Leah is kind of thrown at Jacob as, as take her first. No one's going to marry her, so you should marry her. And so Jacob says, all right, I'll marry her. She's already my wife. And now they rally. But Laban says, hey, if you want to marry Rachel, it's another seven years. So he works another seven years, and then he marries Rachel. Now, this is, again, where the Bible is descriptive and not prescriptive. So this is not like, hey, I don't like my first wife. I'm going to get another. <laughs> okay, don't, don't, don't do that. And then on top of that, when they're trying to have kids, because there's a race to have children, both of them say, hey, you should sleep with my servant, and they'll give you more kids. So we get... Bilhah and Zilpah enter into that equation, and that allows Jacob to have a huge family. Now, this is interesting because this is not God's design, but God uses the way that they acted in order to create a nation from them. So God isn't sanctioning what they're doing. So this is the important part. God's plan from the very beginning has been one man, one woman forever. That's what we read in Genesis. And Jesus says it again in the Gospels, one man, one woman forever. And then Paul restates it again in Ephesians, one man, one woman forever. So this is not what God desired. He used the situation, though, however, to bring about his good outcome. And ultimately, through Jacob, there would be 13 children in all, 12 sons and a daughter named Dinah. Okay? Because someone's in the kitchen with... I'm just making sure you're paying attention now. 
Okay, no, but, but, but here's the thing. Here's what breaks my heart, and I know I, I don't have time to get into it, but it really breaks my heart, is Leah's story. Because she has six children, and as she has her first child, she says, maybe my husband will love me. And then she has a second child, and it's, maybe my husband will pay attention to me now. And the, the beautiful thing, and it's so good, is at the very end, when she has her last child, she says, God is the one who gives me what I need. God is the one who loves me. And, and this is awesome because husbands or wives will never be able to satisfy our souls ever. Even the best among us will never give us what God alone can give us. And this is what Leah discovers. Now, I need to keep moving, and I want to dig into that more, but I need to keep moving because we need to get into the actual encounter with God. So what we know is that Jacob eventually leaves after 20 years. He works seven for, for Leah, he works seven for Rachel, and then he works an additional six. Now, during those additional six years, he develops huge flocks. He becomes wealthy, he becomes rich, and he has all these possessions, but there becomes friction between him, his shepherds, and Laban and, the, and his shepherds. And so this conflict between the two causes him to leave, and he does what Jacob does. He runs away. <laughs> So he ran away from Esau, and now he picks up and he runs away from Laban. And Laban chases him, and he chases him from, from Haran for a long ways before he catches up to him. And there's a really cool story there about Rachel deceiving, and because she's hiding his, his idols, and there's all this deceit that goes on. But eventually, God tells Laban not to mess with Jacob, so Laban says, okay, you're good to go. Now the problem is that now, as Jacob returns back to the promised land, that he is going to encounter whom? Esau. So his brother has been chilling in the promised land while Jacob has been away in Haran. And now he is coming back to the promised land and doesn't know what to expect. Now the last time he saw Esau, Esau basically said, I'm going to kill you. And so he doesn't want to go back into the promised land with all these possessions and his whole family and get them murked. <laughs> so the desire here is that he would appease Esau. And he starts sending things to Esau, possessions. He starts sending messengers to Esau. And the first messenger he sent to Esau comes back and says, <coughs> uh, he says, your brother Esau is coming to meet you with 400 men. Is that a good indication or a bad indication? <coughs> yeah, that's bad. Just in case you're wondering how your brother is feeling, if he sends 400 men with him, it's probably not a good thing. And so these 400 men are coming. Jacob knows this, and this is part of his encounter with God. Is God is going to bring Jacob to the point where he recognizes his need for God. And this is where we enter our story. That was a long preface. Were you having trouble paying attention? I was having trouble paying attention. <laughs> okay, so let's, let's get into the story, all right? So the story begins, and we're going to focus in Genesis 32, and it starts with Jacob praying. I love this because Jacob's had encounters with God before through angels. But in this encounter, Jacob's going to actually encounter God. And we'll see that in a second. But it starts in verse 9 with him praying. Then Jacob prayed, O God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac. So full stop right there. He starts with the covenants. He starts with, uh, God, this is the arrangement that we have. You made a promise to my, my forefathers that you would do something. God already knows that, so Jacob isn't reminding God. He is reminding himself. And this is good even when we pray. Have you ever started off a prayer like that? God, Father, Father of my, my ancestor Abraham, my ancestor, and you can say Jacob. These are all our spiritual ancestors. And so he starts his prayer by recalling the promise that he was given, the covenant. <coughs> and then he says, Lord, you who said to me, go back to the country and your relatives and I will make you prosper. So he's saying, God, you made this covenant and then you called me back. I'm going to do what you told me to do. And my brother is there. God already knows this, but he's reminding God and himself of what he is going to do. Look at verse 10, and I love this. you got to camp here for a second. I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant. This is so good. Why? 
man, because without Jesus, we are not worthy of being in this close relationship that we can enjoy through him. We're reminded at the end of every one of our prayers, and you'll notice whenever I end a prayer, I say in Jesus' name because it's a reminder to me and a reminder to us that we are not worthy or able to come into the presence of God without the forgiveness of Jesus. Like this is an amazing thing in and of ourselves. We are unworthy. We are unable. This is why Jesus is so important because when we know him, we don't approach God as distant, but we approach him as his children. This is huge. So I think even now, when I read that from my own, my own heart, I say, God, without Jesus, I would be unworthy. And even all the good things you have given me have been only because you are good, not because I deserved them. And so this is such a good reminder for us in prayer. God, you have given me so much more than I deserve. You have been so good to me. And then he remembers what God has done. I had only my staff when I crossed this Jordan. But now I have become two camps. So as he, he's remembering, he left fleeing with only a staff, and he has come back a wealthy man. And he recognizes that the only reason he has these things is because of God. Now look at verse 11. Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau, for I am afraid. Full stop. So I don't, know, I don't know how intimate you are with God when you pray. I don't know how able you are to share your true heart, but that's what God wants. So being able to say, I am afraid, I, I don't know about you, but just I have a hard time of admitting emotions I don't like. Maybe it's just me. <laughs> Actually, I don't think it's just me. A lot of dudes have that problem, right? So when a guy, like, he'll get his leg blown off, but he doesn't want to admit that he's in pain. Anybody like that? You see a guy that gets wounded mortally, and he's the black knight all of a sudden, and it's a flesh wound. <laughs> and, and so many times, at least guys, and maybe ladies too, have an, a problem being vulnerable about emotions that we don't like. And I love with God that we just bring what we got, because he knows what's in there anyway. <laughs> you can't hide that from God. If you're angry, tell him. If you're sad, tell him. If you're frustrated, tell him. And in this case, Jacob's like, I am afraid. And he had a very real fear. He believed that when he walked back into the place that God had called him, he was going to be killed and his family along with him. I am afraid he, Esau, will come and attack me. And also the mothers with their children. But you have said, I will surely make you prosper and will make your descendants like the sand of the sea, <coughs> which cannot be counted. Thank you, sir. Gentleman and a scholar. <sighs> Refreshing. Now, um, look at what's going on here. Jacob is sending these envoys, and he sends a grip load of materials. Look at, look at it, it describes 200 female goats, 20 male goats, 200 ewes, and 20 rams, 30 female camels with their young, 40 cows, 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys, 10 male donkeys, and a partridge and a pear tree. <laughs> like, he gives all that he's got. Why? Because if this doesn't work, he's going to lose them anyway. <laughs> he's like, God, I'm praying, but I'm sending the goods as well. I don't know if this is going to work, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trust you but I'm going to kind of hedge my bets as well. I'm not sure if this is actually going to work. And it writes, <clears throat> it says, I will pacify him with these gifts. This is his thought. I am sending on ahead later when I see him, perhaps he will receive me. Now let's transition into, into Jacob's encounter with God. Now hear this. Full stop. If, if you've heard this story before, do not come gently into this story. Put yourself where Jacob is. He's afraid that he's going to lose everything that God has provided. He's afraid that he's going to lose his wives, he's going to lose his children, he's going to lose his property, and he's going to lose his life. He's praying to God, asking for God to do something that he himself cannot do. At this point, he is 97 years old. Keep that in mind. He is 97 years old, which although people live longer back in the day, this is still an older man. Although he has come to face to face with angels before. And we read in scripture when he was at Bethel, he saw, he saw the stairway to heaven, right? Not Led Zeppelin, Bible. <laughs> and then we know later on, he, he was also, he had, he had angels that visited him earlier in this chapter. But now he would come face to face with God. Look at verse 22. 
That night, Jacob got up and took his two wives and two female servants and 11 sons and crossed the fjord of the Jabbok. Now, interestingly enough, and I'll just say this briefly, that Jacob, Jabbok, and struggled in the Hebrew all sound very similar. And so this story is going to have some really cool, interesting Hebrew implications that the original audience wouldn't have heard, just throwing that out, that they would hear things that we wouldn't hear about the connection. Now, he took all of his possessions and took them across the fjord of the Jabbok River, heading into the promised land, and then he himself went back to be by himself. We don't know why he did that, but this is the night, a long night by himself, and you can imagine that he would not be sleeping well. He didn't know what he would encounter. Look at verse 23. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. And then verse 24. So Jacob was left alone. Just stop, full stop. If you're living into that moment, he is afraid. He is alone. It is dark. I mean, it is dark, dark. We don't even understand in our modern context how dark it gets without light pollution unless you've been backpacking deep into Colorado and you know it gets dark, dark. When there's no light, there is no light. He probably is wrestling with all that's going on. And then what happens? A hand grabs a hold of him. Oh, come on. You're not even here. So if you're in the moment and you're worried and then you get grabbed hold of. And here's what it says. A man wrestled with him until daybreak. Now the man is unidentified at this point. It's part of the reason that it was dark. And we need to understand as this man wrestles with him later on, we are informed that this is either an angel of the Lord or this is God himself. So you have a man and God. You have, you can do the church answer with me. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah, so, so experts are divided. Some people think it's just the angel of the Lord. Some people think it's a Christophany, which is a pre-incarnate Christ. I'm going to go my, from myself, in my opinion, that it's a pre-incarnate Christ. And I love this. Jesus comes down to wrestle with Jacob. Now, here's why this is important. It's because Jesus is wrestling with Jacob. Jacob is not wrestling with Jesus. Jesus came hold and, and came down and laid hold of him. They were grappling. This term wrestling means to, to get dirty or dusty. It means they were doing some MMA stuff in, on the ground. This 97-year-old man is wrestling. And he doesn't know who he's wrestling with, but he's wrestling for his life. Can you imagine that scenario? I don't know who you are, but stop. You're wrestling hard, wrestling hard, wrestling hard. Now, now when I was doing MMA, my trainer was awesome. And every time I made an improvement, I was like, oh, man, I'm going to get him. And what I didn't realize is I was in sixth gear and he was in first gear. <laughs> and so every time I learned something new, he'd be like, try this. I'm like, oh, that really hurts. And then he would teach me that way. But I always thought I was keeping up with him. There is no one who can fight against God. Just keep that in mind. The angel is, at any point, can stop and end this fight flat. But what he is wrestling with Jacob, what he is wrestling with him for, what he is struggling with him for, is not to win a wrestling match. He is fighting for his life. What he must do for Jacob is to bring him to the end of his self-sufficiency is to bring him to the end of himself and for him to realize that no matter how much he tries in this life, no matter how many tricks he tries, no matter how much deceit there is, that he needs what only God can provide. This wrestling match is for Jacob's soul. And Jacob is wrestling hard. This is a long fight. They wrestled until daybreak. Jacob was in a fight that he could not win. God was working Jacob over so that he would see the very end of himself. He would recognize his need. This is what some people have called a severe mercy of God. That God would actually provide difficulty in order to get us to surrender. That's ultimately what God is looking for in Jacob. Jacob must surrender his independence. He must surrender the idea that he can make it through this life okay. He must be stripped of his self-confidence because there is no one who is too weak to save. But there are many who are too strong and too proud to ask for salvation. 
In fact, Paul talks about this, and, and this is something that is important for all believers and, and people who are even interested in learning about Christ. Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians 12. He said that I was given a thorn in the flesh, a physical weakness to prevent me from becoming proud. And I prayed to God three times, God, take this from me. And many of you know God's response. He said, my grace is sufficient for you. I'm not going to take away the hurt. <laughs> I may not even take away the struggle. But when you believe and follow me, I will give you grace sufficient for the need. I will give you grace sufficient for the struggle. I will give you grace sufficient for the moment. And then Paul continues, for my power is made perfect in weakness. No one wants to hear this, but if you've ever trusted in Jesus Christ, this is our story, this is our song. <laughs> we are weak in need of God, and there is a big God for my weakness. But this is what Jacob must come into terms with before he enters into the promised land again. Look at verse 25. When the, men saw, when the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip, so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Now, here, here's what I, I want you to hear here. Th this is Jesus or an angel of the Lord wrestling with the man. Who's in trouble here? The man, thank you, Jacob. Really easy, really easy answer there. So what it, what it says here is, is when, when, when the man, the angel, or Jesus, saw that he could not overpower him, when he saw that Jacob was not going to give up, Jacob's still stubborn, right? Have you ever been there? Yes, right? Because who wins always? God. I mean, God does win. Imagine trying to wrestle with God and like, no, I'm going to get him this time. See, we laugh at that, but how many times do our lives actually show that we do that? God, I'm going to wrestle this out with you. Uh -uh, I want my own way. I'm going to be proud on this. I'm going to be stubborn. I'm going to do my own thing. And this is what we see in him. And when he sees that the man, I love this because this is how powerful God is. He just touches him. Like, they're wrestling, and this 97-year-old is giving all he's got. Like, I'm like, way to go, Gramps. Get after it. And he's getting into it, man. Can you imagine? He's fighting for his life, and all of a sudden, it's bing. No! Oh! And if you've ever jacked up your hip, my friend, if you ever popped your sciatic nerve or something like that, you know this is not good times. And so I, I love it here because this is a very different version of touched by an angel. <laughs> and it's not, it's not a good one. <laughs> But ultimately, because Jacob's still going to fight, he's like, okay, do you realize how quickly I can end this? Done. And I love that moment. Again, this is a severe mercy. Why did he touch his hip? So he couldn't run away. Come on. It's so good. Because what does Jacob do? I can imagine just like, I'm out. I'm going to run. I ran from Esau. I ran from Laban. And the angel's like, you ain't going anywhere. We've got some business to tend to. Now, look what he says in verse 26. The man said, let me go for it is daybreak. Again, a lot of this happens at night. Jacob doesn't know who he's wrestling with. And some of this may be to obscure the fact that he can't actually see God. All right, there's, there's a lot in there that we can't get to right now. But for every reason, he says, I can let me go. Let go of me. <laughs> this is done. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. This is the turning point. This is the turning point. Because there is no blessing without surrender. There is no relationship with God without surrender. There is, not, there, there is no intimate, deep fellowship with God to truly know Him. Not just know about Him, but to know Him we, without the initial surrender to God. God, I can't do this. I need you. God, I've made a, a terrible mess of my life. God, I need you. I need you. I surrender. Help me. This is the turning point of Jacob's story. I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. I've wanted blessing from my father. I tried to get blessing everywhere I went, and now I know that I need you, and I'm not letting go until you bless me. And look what he says. The man asked him, what is your name? So huge. What is your name? Because remember we said earlier on that the name represents the identity. What he is saying is, who are you? Who are you? What is your identity? How do you define yourself? Who are you? It's a question that you maybe have asked yourself. Who am I? What's my purpose in this life? What am I doing? What's my identity? And look at his answer, Jacob. 
I'm a trickster. I'm a deceiver. I'm a heel grabber. And what we know is that Jacob lived up to his name. Now, here's the most beautiful part of the story. Look at verse 28. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and humans and have overcome. So good. <laughs> I, I, I need this. I, I'm hoping you need this too, because this is God's truth for us. He changed his identity. You are no longer Jacob. That is no longer who you are, but through me, I have changed who you are. You have a new name. You are different. You are a new creation. You're no longer Jacob. That is in the past. That's no longer who you are or how you relate to me. You are new. And I love the way he gives him the, a new identity, the same way he did Abraham, the same way he did Sarah. He changed their name. He spoke authority into their lives and let them know that they were something that they were not before. Whenever you wrestle with Jesus and surrender, your life is marked by that. There is no way that you can encounter the living God and not be changed. There's just no way. It can't happen unless you don't understand what you've encountered. Unless you don't understand the power of God and his love and his grace and his mercy, he will change you from the very core and then you'll spend your life as I will with that change working its way out from the inside out. But at the very base, your name is changed. Now look at this, because he changed his name to Israel. Israel is a compound word. Two words, Isra and El. El is a reference to God, Elohim. So we get names like Daniel right? Daniel. It's got God's name in it. And so God is El. What is Isra? <laughs> Isra means to fight with God, to contend with God. Now, it, normally when the word itself would mean something different. It's interesting the way they interpret it. Most of the time when we, we hear this word, it means God fights, God dominates, God is in charge. But look at the way the angel explained it for Jesus. You've been named Israel because you have struggled with God and humans and have overcome. He gives the name a different meaning. Because he has struggled with God and with humans. Because of his pride and stubbornness, God had to fight with Jacob, now Israel. His name marks that fight. And as the father of the people of Israel, God would fight for his people. Now, here's why this is important, because we trace our spiritual lineage back to this man, and every time we say his name, it is a reminder of who God is. It's a reminder of who he is and what he will do. God will fight for us. Every time they refer to the nation of Israel, they're referring to a God who, who owned his people. They belonged to him. He loved them and would fight for them, even though they often fought with him. This name is a reminder of not only the new identity of Jacob, but the new identity of God's people. I hope you're feeling some of this because this is some good business up in here. Now, we see that Jacob had struggled and he'd overcome and he had been marked by it, but the story's not over. Look at verse 29. Jacob said, please tell me your name. I think this is still some old Jacob <laughs> just looking to get some leverage. <laughs> who, who is this? <laughs> But he replied, why do you ask my name? And then he blessed him there, and then he was out. And so Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, it is because I have, check this out, saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. Man, so good. See, here's something, here's, uh, let me just finish this up, and then I want to make a comment about this. Because he saw God face to face, and then he, he named the place as a remembrance to what happened there. But it doesn't stop there. In verse 31, the sun rose above him, and he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the Israelites do not eat the tendon attached to the socket of the hip, because the socket of Jacob's hip was touched near the tendon. Now, that's not in Mosaic law, but it is customary for Hasidic Jews and others not to eat that tendon. Why? To remember, people. To remember 
See, you and I, regardless if our brains are functioning well, we have such bad short-term memories when it comes to God. Like we walk through all these amazing events in our lives and then something happens and we're like, where are you, God? Instead of remembering all the times that he has shown up. Like if you live long enough, you should have just a list of monuments to his faithfulness. A list of things that he has brought you through. That you can go back and say, this is Peniel, I've been here. This is, oh, why don't we eat that tendon, kids? We don't eat that tendon because you remember how God dealt with Israel. You remember how the story of our God, our creator deals with us. We have these monuments. And maybe you just start putting sticky notes on places. I'm serious because we forget about the character of God. We need reminders. Do you have places in your world, maybe you can go only in pictures where you remember the goodness of God. Blow up that picture and put it on your wall. And then when you're looking at it, you can be reminded, this is what God did here. This is what God did now. So when you struggle and wrestle with the difficulties of life and you know they're coming, maybe you're in it right now. You can say, I go back to this place and remember what God did. I go back to this place. And here's what's cool about hearing these stories, these true accounts of people that encountered God, is we go back to their stories and now their stories are ours. Hey, remember that time where God showed up for Jacob and changed his name? That's my story because that's my spiritual lineage. That same God who dealt with Jacob and made him Israel is the same God who transformed me and made me new through Jesus Christ. This is my story. Let me give you a few things here. We talk about being made new, and I'll make this quick. Now, again, I I hit you with a lot of details today because the story is too good. Please go home and read it. It's so good. I missed out on a ton. But I want to give you some implications of some things that you've heard today. And it's called being made new. Because this relates to each one of us. That when we trust in Jesus Christ, when we own that we cannot do it by ourselves, and maybe this is where God has been wrestling you to to break you of your self-sufficiency and to show you of your need for him, the first thing that we get is a new identity. Now, a, a friend of mine defined identity as this. Identity is a set of beliefs, priorities, and values that we hold consciously or unconsciously, which influence every part of our life. Your identity is who you think you are. Your identity is who you identify as. And the only person who has an accurate understanding of your identity is the one who created you. We cannot determine our own identities but we hear from God who we are. And so all of us start off as Jacob. All of us. There is not a person in this world that, is, that came into the world as Israel. We all started off in need of God. And when we trust in Christ, he gives us a new identity. We are no longer defined by our past. This is so important to understand. If you walked in here with an overdeveloped sense of how terrible you are, I'm talking to you. Because, man, I should, sometimes I write these sermons for me, I'll be totally honest with you. I feel bad about myself often. When I realize the level of perfection that God desires of me and how pathetically, pitifully, not even close I get to that, I could spend all day kicking myself down the street. Maybe you know, it's like a spiritual OCD, and it's not good. And so I need to know, because not because I feel it, Not because I even believe it sometimes, not because I think it, but because God has said it. I am no longer who I was before Christ. That leads me to a very important truth, that you have a B.C. and an A.D. self. No matter if you were saved when you were three years old, there was a before Christ stage. And there is an after discipleship stage. You you are different. You are marked. If God has touched you, you have been transformed and you are growing into the new identity that God has called forth from within you. That is an amazing thing and it is available to you through Christ. Now secondly, and this goes right along with it, is freedom from my past. Oh man. Man, I, I, I feel bad about things I did in kindergarten. I think I've told you before, but I ate, I ate two bowls of... I ate two bowls of Fruit Loops one morning because I thought I was hungry. It turns out I was sick. And I threw up all over Tara Oni. And she was this cute little girl in this white dress, and it was really special. <laughs> and I couldn't tell my teacher fast enough. I'm like, Mrs. Sam, and then 
And I, 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 to this day, friends, this was 40 years ago. <laughs> and the look on Tara Oni's face, there are times when I am driving down the street and, and I see her face and I feel awful. I'm just giving you a level of my dysfunction this morning. <laughs> now, see, some of you on the other side, and you can't feel bad about anything. I feel bad about everything, even stuff I've been forgiven of. So what I need and what we need is this. You have been forgiven of your past if you're in Christ. You are no longer defined by who you used to be. The only thing that your past exists for is for the praise of God's deliverance and a reminder not to go back there. Does that make sense? The only reason you have a past is to give you a reason to praise God that you are no longer that person. It is not to be dwelled upon, it is to be learned from. Yet too many of us think, well, I'm this person, I can't do any of the stuff that God tells me to do. Nonsense. Your identity is new, you are free in him, your past is just that. Amen? Come on now. Finally, we have a new focus. Christianity is not about adding Jesus to your life. This is the mistake we make so often. They're like, yeah, I need me some of that Jesus. I, I need me some of that freedom. So I'm just going to add him to all the other things in my life and let him orbit around me. That's what I need. It's just a little bit of Jesus. It doesn't work that way. Jesus cannot be added to anything. Because he always becomes the center. Christ must be the center of our lives. That's the only place he can truly occupy if you've come to know him. And so many times we battle against that, don't we? We just want to be in control. We don't want to be surrendered. We don't want to be yielded. God, let me do my thing. And God's like, your thing has always failed. You're like, But I feel like it's going to win this time. <laughs> it won't. Instead, he calls us to make him the very center of all that we are. And when we do, we experience life and life to the full. Here's the deal. Don't miss this. Because so many of us know so much about God and don't know him very well. So many of us can tell all these facts and figures and stories about God, yet we don't know him. He does nothing to animate our hearts. There's no joy. There's no life. God never called us to know him like a dictionary. He called us to know him as a friend. He called us to know him as a savior. Friends, this is the God that wants to be in your world now. The God that is meant to be the center of all things. And when he is, our lives are marked and changed when we surrender to that. He is good. Oh, I've given you so much. I feel like one of those big sprinklers. They keep... <sighs> So you drive out, you drive out east, and they've got those big ones that are just lobbing like thousands of gallons of water. I hope today that you've heard that God is calling you to surrender for your blessing, that you may know Jesus Christ and know Him intimately. That is what He is for. Let's pray to that end. Father, we thank you. We thank you that we don't have to continue to wrestle with you but instead because of your great love that we can rest in you. Father, help us today. We are in need of you. Father, we look to you to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. On the cross, you showed the limitless love of your son. God, you took our place, that you triumphed over death on the cross. And that by doing so, Father, the victory that you declared to the world becomes our victory through faith in you. God, we thank you that simply by trusting and surrendering ourselves to you, that you give us new life and hope, purpose, that we might live with hope, truth, and purpose for our lives. God, we ask that you would move in our hearts that as your Holy Spirit applies your word, that we would be transformed and live more and more into our new identity. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.